Good Friday morning. It's Julie Murphy with Arizona Farm Bureau. And guess what we're doing? As always, talk to a farmer Friday. Uh, for those that, of you that will be joining us live, uh, thank you for joining us. And we also will save this session to um, Instagram. We'll upload it on Facebook, also on YouTube, and share it on our web pages. So we know not everybody's going to get to see this session on the live version of it, but there's other opportunities for you to see it. Well, we're starting a new series, and I'm calling this only because I'm stealing the name from the USDA, the Census of Agriculture series. So we're going to talk numbers, and I'm going to talk numbers with the most important numbers guy when it comes to the agricultural uh, census, at least here in Arizona. Um, I know there's a cadre of you with the USDA, USDA that are doing this, but Dave DeWalt is with uh, USDA with the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Did I get it yes, right? You got it. So it's USDA NAS if we just use acronyms, but sometimes uh, for our um, loyalists that come on the show on a regular basis and ask us questions and you might not be familiar with ag, we want to try to stay away from acronyms too much. But Dave, we've now come out with the latest census. And so I guess my first question to you is, kind of give us an overview. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to do this. I appreciate the time. Um, yeah, Census of Agriculture results came out in February. And what I really want to start off with is, we have two programs within NAS. We have the Census of Agriculture which is done every five years. Mm -hmm. And then we have our annual estimating program, which obviously is right. more current. So the census of agriculture is more about the producers, okay. demographics, okay. whereas the annual estimating program is about crop production, okay. acreage, yield production, prices, value. Um, the census is much more comprehensive it has county level estimates, mm -hmm. whereas our, our annual program, we have very few estimates at our at the county level because we only have Durham wheat, um, all cows, cotton, and milk cows. Oh. That's all the, oh, really? annually. annually. But so every five years, you'll have county level estimates for a variety of much more crops. So it's much more comprehensive. But the main thing is um, demographics. Mm -hmm. it, it describes who the farmers are, what their gender is, their race, their ethnicity, their age. Um, we have young, young farmers that are less than 35 years old. We have those with um, military experience, so veterans. And it's oh, awesome. all part of the demographics that come out with these statistics. Um, another thing that is with census that you don't get with the annual estimate program is total harvested cropland. Okay. So in on the annual, you just get your major crops, cotton, alfalfa, wheat, etc. You don't get all the other little things. Oh, okay. The minor commodities, what it's we call them. It's almost like you're looping all of the ag commodities into the census of ag, as many as you can anyway, right? Right. Right, and okay. So the latest numbers are from 19... 2022, whereas our annual program, we just put out estimates of what's going to be planted this year, 2024, right. uh, but it's only the major crops, okay. cotton, alfalfa, etc. And one thing I want to clarify, so the latest census was just released in February, but it's data based on when you were capturing the census in 2022. Two, correct? Yes, at the at the end of nineteen. Go again. <laughs> the end of twenty twenty two, we nationally sent out three million questionnaires to who we thought were producers, known producers. Okay. And the results of that, it it took a long time to number one collect the data. It's like a six month data collection okay. period. Whereas our, our quarterly or annual estimates, we take two weeks to collect that data. And sure. it's a sample, it's not a census. So the but, annual but the is- the census is you're attempting to get everyone. To count every to count producer. Everyone. Right. So dare I ask, do you feel like 
all the numbers related to Arizona is probably really representative, maybe not 100% absolutely, but probably high 80s, low 90s percent of the farmers because you want to get everybody you can, right? Well, we account for every farm that we oh, know really? of. Okay. It, and if we didn't get a response, we may have other sources of data, like maybe an earlier response okay. in 2022, or we, we just have ways, there's statistical methodology to sure. to measure any incompleteness, if you will. Wow. Yeah. So, I, I, again, going back, and I'm just saying this out loud more than once to get it in my head, um, you're really drilling down and reaching out to every farmer and rancher and dairy man or woman that's out there. Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's cool. And that's the same thing that we're trying to do with the American census that's done every 10 years. So the difference and the distinction of those two, the ag census is every five years, where our national regular census is every decade. Right. The other thing that I think it's important is this is kind of data collection in a moment of time. And we, and that's one of the reasons why you need to do this every five years, correct? Right, well, plus it's very expensive to do. You well, wouldn't want to true. do it every year. It right. would be virtually impossible to do and sure. it costs a lot of money. Right. But it's done every five years. It's been done this way actually since the 1840s. Okay. I think this was our 30th wow. census of agriculture. Now, NAS has only been conducting it since 1997. Okay. We took over from the uh, Department of Commerce. Oh, really? Yeah, they used to do okay. the census all the way back to the 1840s up until 1997. Then it switched over to uh, USDA, and we've been responsible for it ever since. Okay. So for us, it's our sixth iteration okay. of the census. So for this most recent census that was just, again, released in February, so that's why I'm launching into this two-month session or two-month uh, series talking about it. Um, so it is new to us in terms of its release, but this is data that was collected in 2022. And again, that time period that it takes for you to capture the data, aggregate it, and then release it to us. So, but I have to ask this question for you as a statistician, what stands out the most to you about this year's or the 2022? The results? Yeah, the results. That's a better way to say it, the results. I think one of the more interesting aspects is how concentrated agriculture is to a very few farms. Mm -hmm. We have a one table in each of the releases, census of ag release, that shows how concentrated, the way we set it up is how many farms does it take to get 10% of the value of sales? And then we have 25%, 50%, 75%. Okay. And what I wanted to tell you was, so the fewest farms to get the 75% of sales. Now I'm going to go back to 2012. So oh, that's okay. two census ago. Okay. It took, in Arizona, it took 168 farms to get 75% of sales. 75% of ag sales. The, the value. The right. value. Okay. Right. Just 168. Okay. We okay. we have 16,710 this year. Yes. Farms, Farms in, Arizona. in Arizona. So Arizona. only 168 are needed to reach that 75 percent wow. value of production. Um, in 2017, so the previous census, it took 135 farms. Okay. So it's fewer wow. farms. Fewer farms. And now this time, only 114. Wow. So we're getting more concentrated. The farms are getting bigger, mm -hmm. and the smaller farms, mid-sized farms, are basically going away. Okay. And that's not only in Arizona; that's across, across the, the nation. United States. Yes. So there's consolidation, which is yes, not unusual in business for consolidation. Which is a good segue to my next question: Is the number of farms? Arizona Farm Bureau is beginning the release of a social media highlight of all of the census of agriculture numbers and the first that we released was just this week i believe joel i hope i'm right on that and it was on the number of farms and we also compared it to 
the number of farms nationally. We just shared the national number of farms in and, and, and Arizona and it's 16,000, 16,000. 710. 16,710. So Arizona shows a 12% drop. Right. Um, where is most of this, and you alluded to it really, the smaller farms. Yes. So most of the drop is happening with our smaller farms. Yes, and it's not only in Arizona, it's, it's across the okay. United States. Uh, the U.S. number of farms dropped 7%. Right. We dropped, Arizona dropped 12%, and we, we have the different sales groups. 87% uh, of the farms that went down from last census were those with sales of less than 2500 Okay, $2,500. Yeah. And so. the, the largest group is the only one that increased in number of farms. Those were with $5 million worth of sales or more. They increased, but every size farm under that decreased, decreased. from 217 so that means if I had, what is it, gross sales of five million, the likelihood of me still being around is is evident because your numbers are indicating that. Right. But if I am a small farmer and my annual income on that was 2,500 in gross sales, the chances of me not staying in farm farming just because of farming is hard, that's it. And you can't say an opinion. You're yeah. you're you're presenting unbiased yes. data. But coming from a farm family, one of the things I've always been struck with is, and and you grew up on a small farm, yes. a hobby farm. Um, sure, five acres. Five acres. Mm -hmm. it, it was hard work. Yeah, we were out there. We had chores. Yeah. <laughs> every day. Right. So mm -hmm. um, it's just interesting to see some of the things that are going on. Well, uh, let me just say, yeah. a lot of these smaller farms are hobbies or lifestyle. Sure. And so either they're working off the farm to support their hobby, which we all do some way, mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, most of these farms, a vast majority of the farms in Arizona, are in Apache County, Navajo County, Coconino County. The small farms. The small farms. Okay. Okay. Navajo Nation, Hopi Nation. It is more of a cultural event or issue. It's They're it's what they do. They they their farm. They're considered producers. They may have six sheep, ten horses, five cows, and two goats. And, and that qualifies them as a producer. Right. Uh, the threshold, just to report that, just for our listeners that might not know, the threshold to be classified as a farm is sellable product up to $1,000. $1,000 worth. worth of sales. Yeah. And, and it's been the same definition for the last 50 years. And a lot of those uh, tribal land farms, a lot of the tribes do have large farms, but a lot of those farms that have now... Uh, worthy of the count should have been counted a long time ago you guys started counting i think in 2007 yeah we started counting tribe individual tribal operators in 2007 right because they thought they were being underrepresented right in the numbers that right. were being produced so usda told us you have to count these individually right. and again cultural especially for arizona because we're a state that happens to have most tri uh tribes and there's another interesting statistic that comes out of that because of it so I think it's glorious that you guys are counting it but one of the other things that you USDA taught me is a lot of those tribal land farms are subsistence they're either raising for themselves and their neighbors and they also might be growing ceremonial corn for some of their ceremonies mm -hmm. again a very treasured uh, cultural aspect of it that we can absolutely be proud of here in Arizona and I think is unique to yeah. what even you as statisticians get to do uh, to make sure that it's all fairly represented. Sure. sure. Yeah. And another interesting part, um, given the number of American Indian producers, the percentage of female producers yeah. 
in Arizona is almost 48%, which is number one in the nation. 48% of the producers in Arizona are female. Right. And a lot of it is due to the Navajo Nation, Hopi Nation, American Indian Farms. Right. Um, because they're that, more of yeah. a matriarchal society, yeah. correct? Yeah. And so the female in that family is listed as the primary owner, or right? Takes care of the smaller livestock, sort of. Okay. They they kind of probably take more ownership. Sure. Now, I'm just saying that off anecdotally. I don't have any statistics on that, but it just appears that they handle the livestock issues primarily the smaller animals and if there's a a, a male they'll take care of the cattle okay but it's not a hundred percent either but, way but. but it's some sometimes what you see break out pausing for station identification by the way this is julie murphy with arizona farm bureau and it's our weekly talk to a farmer friday on friday and we're starting a new series beginning with dave dewalt he's first out the shoot so that we can celebrate and discuss what was just released, the 2022. I know you think I'm saying the year wrong because we're in 2024, but it's the 2022 Census of Agriculture that was released just in February, um, latter part of February, right? So um, I want to give props to Dave DeWalt uh, on this point because literally I gave you about a week to write the Census of Agriculture article that we got in our March issue of Arizona Agriculture comes out in February. You know me, the publisher. I want to get, I wanted to get it out as quick as possible for a monthly publication. So we were able to put it in the March issue of Arizona Agriculture. And if you drill down, we also shared it on our blog. So even if you're not a member and don't get the publication, we also shared the article on Arizona Farm Bureau's website, which is azfb.org, or just Google Arizona Farm Bureau and look for our website. Uh, the value proposition to anyone, whether you're in agriculture or not, is understanding our agriculture in America. And that's, to me, so important with all the things we do. So having said that, um, specific to Arizona, what is most important in your eyes as a statistician, Dave, uh, for consumers to know about the census of ag and why it's a valuable, a valuable document for them as well it is, as it is for me, a farm kid, and that has a passion and a heart for agriculture. I mean, there's some real value here for the consumer. Yeah. I think one of the biggest successes in Arizona is how productive our farmers are. Mm -hmm. Those few that produce 75% are very productive and they are very efficient. They, they're just able to put food on people's table for a lot less than many other producers across the country because of the great weather, the great water, the efficiency that they've built into. Granted, they are very large farms, but they're very productive. Um, the, de the, the data the, no, data has value not only to the producers, but the input providers, because those that pr provide fertilizer, um, water, input providers. Um, also, those that study agriculture, researchers all over the country are going to be using this data for the next five years to study agriculture. Right. Um, policymakers, they're going to be using it, especially this year with the farm bill. That at the national level. at the national level, they're going to be uh, using these numbers when they're discussing what the farm policy should be in the United States. It the data is basically for anyone who depends on food, fiber, and fuel. So that means everybody. Everybody. Yeah, every, exactly. it's important for everybody. And sometimes we might yawn at numbers, but to me, even though I ended up in journalism and not an engineer, <laughs> uh, the value proposition to me is just, again, going back to what I said earlier, understanding agriculture in the United States in general, across the United States, and certainly here in Arizona, 
I think it's fun to kind of highlight some of these very interesting points. The fact that the state of Arizona has the largest population of female farmers. And most of that is thanks to the Navajo and Hopi tribes and that matriarchal influence within that uh, community. So um, those are all cool and fun statistics. And um, were there any surprises to for you? Well, one thing you, you asked about other items that stood out and from last census was um, nut acreage oh, okay. in Arizona. Pecan and pistachio acreage increased quite a bit down in southeastern Arizona and in Mojave County in northwestern yeah. yep. Arizona. The nut acreage I think overall went up 5,000 acres. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was, I knew there was going to be a expansion but I just didn't know how much. How much. How and much. now we know with the data. Right. Um, our three major producing counties, Maricopa, Yuma, and Pinal County, they still remain in the top 40 counties in the United States as far as production. Wow. Top 40. Top 40. Maricopa and Yuma I think are number 25, 26. Wow. And Pinal still remained at 38 I believe. So the top 40 of all of the counties across the United right. States. That is just so impressive. Yep, yeah. I, I think it is too. Um, average age still increasing, mm -hmm. and that shouldn't be a surprise. Right. I think the average age in Arizona now is 60. In fact, I noticed that our average age for the farmer here in Arizona was a little bit higher than the national. I think on the national it was 58 or 59. I could yes, be wrong. Yes, yeah, it was but, yeah, a little bit higher. A little bit higher, not by much, but a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And back to the American Indians, uh, two out of every three producers in Arizona are American Indians. Are American Indians. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, in fact, to highlight that point, so before the subsistence farms on the tribal lands were counted, we were kind of around the 7,000, 7,500 um, farms in the state of Arizona. Then as of did I say it right? 2007, 2007 mm -hmm. when we started counting the tribal farms, the smaller ones, uh, because we'd always counted the large tribal farms. We just hadn't counted the individual family farms on the tribal lands. Right. It jumped it all the way up to over 20,000. It was something like 20,000. and Yeah, uh, it was tw just right at 20,000, basically. Right at 20,000. That 000. was in 2012. That was 2012. And, and then 217, we went down to 19,000. Right. But now we're down to 16,700. 16, yeah. yeah. I, I have to confess, and you don't have to make opinion because I know you're, yeah. you present unbiased, <laughs> but it's in some ways when you look at it and you react just to that, it kind of like makes me a little nervous. But, and, and I love that you're giving me, I can even tell by your sunglasses, like, why do you feel that oh, way? Yeah, too? why like, nervous? Why do you feel that? <laughs> and, but your point. I think is when you look at the numbers and you look at the productivity, if I was a little hobby farm at 2,500 and most of that was just, and I had a job off farm to satisfy my hobby and families are just maybe pivoting to being fully focused on that job that's making them money. I, is that part of it? I mean, no, oh, okay. we, we stay as objective as possible, <laughs> unbiased as possible. Do they have what it takes to be considered a farmer? If they do, then they, they're counted. Okay. Um, I guess the thing I should say then is don't look at the number of farms. Look at our productivity overall because we look as productive. Yeah. In yeah. fact, it increased. E even if the number of farms went down, our value of production is either the same or it actually increased. It actually increased. So we're not losing now. There's not going to be a food shortage or anything right. like that. Okay. We're still as productive as we always were. <laughs> it's just that there's not as many farmers. But that's been the case since the beginning of time. Um, 1840, I probably, I'll just make something up here, 80% of the population were producers. Sure. Yeah, you're, you're because right. Because it was before the Industrial Revolution right. and all that. But now we're down to, what, 2% yeah. of the population are producers. Right. right. And, and we have to recognize that 
the, the business model for a lot of families does not include the family farm. They may have a different business model that they want to pursue. Right. Right. So, okay. Um, how can consumers and farmers use this information? You kind of said that a little bit. Like researchers will right. use it to research. Uh, next week I interviewed George Frisbold once again, and he's an economist. So he's definitely going to drill down and grant in a granulated format to this data to help them. And he actually has a very positive act outlook. He's not just looking at farm numbers. He's indicating right now we're a $23.3 billion industry and that's the census of ag influences those numbers, but they also pull from the Department of Labor. They pull from the economic data that's coming out of Arizona individually. They include for food services, right. which you guys aren't addressing no. that in the sense of, of ag, but the census of ag becomes like a baseline of some of the data that they gather. So we know the researchers will use this for their research, mm -hmm. but what other ways can farmers and consumers kind of use this data? Well, it, it probably doesn't hit them directly, but as I mentioned before, the uh, input providers, sure. they'll, they'll know where to, where they need supplies. But I like to look at it at, at the education level. Students can be you're using right. this information if they are working on an ag-related project. Right, you're right. Um, the teachers themselves could use it. They could be teaching math. They could be teaching geography of where crops are grown across the country or pockets here, pockets mm -hmm. there. Um, in fact, I, I've had teachers tell me that, oh yeah, I use NAS State all the time as a source of information. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. And the, the um, data requests that I get, not only from you, but from other... I give them a lot of requests. <laughs> other USDA <laughs> agencies, they want information at the county level for various stuff that our annual program doesn't capture. It's not part of our annual program. And so we have to rely on the census of ag because it has a lot of that county level data. Wow. So government agencies, farm bureaus, commodity organizations, they use all this information one way or the other. And then, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the um, Congress will use it for farm policy and yeah. stuff like that. So it's really, I, I mean, the work that all of you put into it, this ends up being a great resource for us going on until the next one happens. So on a right. personal, I'm asking you a question I didn't send to you in advance, but like when it's all over and you get to see the data, is this exciting to you? Is this like... Well, I like to think that I already knew more or less what was going to come out. Okay. You know, like the nut expansion. Right. I, you, I assumed you it was going to happen, but how much? That's where I may get surprises like that. Yeah. And just all the minutia of the smaller commodities of, you know, you're just kind of surprised. Oh, we grow that here. <laughs> right. And I think the neat thing about the census of agriculture is that you can zero in on it. A, a, one area or aspect of the data and really let it tell you a story. Mm -hmm. And so that's another value proposition. That's why Dave gets an email ping from me often because I'm kind of curious about a certain number in a certain area, especially based on what I'm trying to report as a communicator and marketing individual for Arizona Farm Bureau. But I, I kind of want to land on this last point and is there anything else you'd like to share dave thank you for your time and giving us some insights on this well other than i appreciate you uh, giving me a time to explain what the census of agriculture is and how it's different from our annual estimating program and we always want to thank the uh, producers for providing the information because mm, they are first-hand knowledge of what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. um, we can't just sit behind the desk and, and make it up. You're, you're boots on the ground informants, if you will. That's and true. so we depend on the um, producer to complete the uh, questionnaires. And one thing we really appreciated this year was how many reported online. Oh, good. 
I yeah. think there was a, like a 25% increase in how many reported online versus in two, 2017. That's awesome. So when you report online, it's a lot cheaper to collect the data because we don't have to print as many questionnaires. We don't have to mail out as many questionnaires. We don't have to send people out to Good talk point. to you and do interviews. So if we could encourage you to do it online, which is 100% secure, each individual producer has a unique survey code, if you will. Yeah. And so it's a very safe and expedient way of informing us of what's going on out there. Awesome. Dave DeWalt, as always, thank you. I so appreciate the time you take uh, on our behalf and what you and your fellow uh, team members on this census of agriculture, what it takes, and uh, big thanks to the USDA for spearheading this now. And I just want to leave on this point. Think about it. Of all the counties across the United States, and there's what, thousands of them? Oh, at least I, I want to say it's either 2,000 or 3,000. I don't remember. Two what, to 3,000 yeah. counties, Maricopa, Yuma, Pima County, or Pinal. Uh, Pinal County, land in the top 40 counties of production in agriculture. And that's right here in the state of Arizona. Wow. So I can feel secure that agriculture is strong and thriving here in the state of Arizona. Everyone that joined us, thank you, and stay tuned. We do this every Friday at 10 o'clock. And again, thank you so much, Dave. You're welcome.